so <laughs> you have probably a bit, a bit in, uh, around. Um, he was a master student in Portugal, and I think that that was probably the, the place where like, we actually have to, to, to have to have some kind of contact because uh, he was working with um, a Mendes in there, and then later I went to work with them also as a postdoc. Uh, then he moved to, to Atlanta, uh, to Emory University, where he got the PhD uh, in the group of Stefan Wetcher, uh, the same group where I was in the postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, um, uh, he moved to um, Indiana University uh, and uh, as a postdoc uh, already. And, uh, and uh, after that, he is now in uh, Northeastern University in the group of Alessandro uh, Spignani. So, in the, I mean, uh, that group and uh, was also my previous group has been working a lot on the epidemic modeling. And um, I think this is what he's going to uh, tell us about with uh, the new ingredients that uh, has been developed to, to try to characterize the, the epidemic also, um, not only from the physical parts so of the preparation of the disease, but also from the fact that we are going to be here. So, what I think is now is your turn. Thank you. Uh, first, let me thank all of you for coming and for inviting me to be here today. Uh, as I mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, how we can move towards the characterization of the coupling between behavior and disease spread. I'll start by introducing the, the big uh, simulation platform that, that we developed over several years. And actually, this was developed by a, by a big team scattered between Italy and the US. And we developed this big model on how people travel and get it and spread the disease globally. So I'll discuss this. And then I'll start to use the limitations of this model as a way of introducing what we need to do in order to modify the behavior more into account. Um, so this, of course, since it was developed over many years with several people, there was funding and a lot of leverage, in particular to Balkan, Aubu, Nicola Perra, Sandra Spignani, of course, Jose Hamas, who's over there, Terry Corizzo, Paolo Bayali, etc. Um, one thing we've been hearing about recently and more and more over the last few years is how we are living in a new age, an age of big data. You know, everywhere you, you look, and you can look at the current uh, events, magazines, or economics, or computer science, and even the big nature and science uh, magazines that have the highlights of academia, let's say, and even more popular science ones, they're all talking about this idea of this is the 21st century, we have data about everything you could possibly ever want, and you can do it all just by analyzing data. So my idea, in a sense, is can you use this data as a way not of making people click in little ads on, on the latest website or make people talk about a, a given product or an event, but can you use that to learn about how people behave and then can you use those models also to be, use those data to develop models on, on behavior. So this is, this is part of a trend that has been seen over the last few years also that goes along with this availability of data and and the development of foundational tools to analyze this data has been this, this approach between physics and what and traditional techniques of statistical physics and statistical mechanics and the uh, interaction with social science. And the idea is, okay, so we have to say that we can see how people are moving from one place to another. What happens if we were to <coughs> apply the classical tools of statistical physics and the classical <coughs> concepts and ideas and mechanisms of system mechanics if we were to treat people almost as if they were electrons or particles that we can actually analyze and use these tools to study the behavior. Yeah. So of course the application I'm going to be talking about today is the to epidemics, but this concept and this idea of using physics to study society is a, is more general. And actually the um, one of the original names proposed by was come for sociology was actually social physics. So it was the physics of society and how social behavior. So, and of course the goal when we talk about epidemics, the overall arching goal in the pipe dream that everybody has is can you predict epidemics? Can you, can you do something like we've been doing for a few years now with weather forecasts and can you forecast and say what's going to happen, where the end is going to be, how it's going to progress in time, and how it's going to, how it's going to evolve. Of course, before we could reach this state, where, even in terms of the weather, where we have 
this huge infrastructure of satellites and, and weather stations and monitoring stations and thousands and thousands of people around the world analyzing these patterns and trying to make predictions. And here you will see the progress of Hurricane Charlie in 2005, I think, and different predictions at each point in time with the different airlines. So that cone over there is, is in effect, the, the, the uncertainty on, on the prediction. So the hurricane is actually here, and they're trying to predict over the course of a few days what's going to happen next. So this is our overall goal. Can we do, knowing that there is an outbreak of a disease in some place, can we make a prediction of what's going to happen in one week, in two weeks? Etc. So, of course, before, before this, we have to understand the dynamics of the system, we have to model it, we have a good understanding of the, of the basics, and then you have to start building the system from scratch. Now, if you're talking about epidemics, you're talking about how people move and how people interact. So the first step in this, and it's the first component of the, of the modeling platform I, I, started, I mentioned earlier, is the population distribution. So where, where are people located around the world? So we have data from, from uh, LandScan, which is a, a big global project that basically looks at different indicators and census data, etc., to find exactly how many people live inside each of those tiny little cells over there. So they divide the world into small little cells, and they, and they tell you for each of these cells there are 10 people in here, 100 people, 1 million people, etc. Okay? So you have this worldwide distribution. Of population, so you know where people are based, more or less. You also need to know where people travel. So to use this to know, and, the, and here, for now, I'm talking about travel, like long-term travel, long-distance travel, so talking about flights. For this, there is the YAT and the OED databases that basically include 99% of all traffic. So they tell you, you can go there, you, you ask them nicely, and they'll sell you the data, if you're lucky. So you pay for it, and they'll give you a big file that has the location of every airport in the world, and how many flights go from one airport to the other by each company in each day. So you can know exactly, more or less, how many people are, are flying between each, each location. So here you can see the little red dots, which you might not be able to see very well, are actually the airports. And you can use these, these airports <coughs> to divide the population. Huh? Instead of having just this big, I mean, this big continuous function of population more or less in size, you can divide and use a technique called coronavirus isolation, which of course you've all heard of, to divide the whole population into aggregation basins. So these are basically the areas where one person is likely to travel. Right? So if you have an airport there, in Indianapolis, that's where was my old airport when I was in Vienna, this is more or less the area where where people would use that airport to fly. And of course, this area is defined since it's a worldwide isolation, it's being the area that is closest. So it's the range where that airport is the closest one. So now, at this point, you have a bunch of basins. So these are basically attraction basins for when people travel. That allows, using these basins, you can connect them using good flights, so you know how people are flying around the world. You can, of course, analyze the the flight distribution, the flight network, we know that it's a complex network with the power of distributed, the exponents are not containing to some degree. It's a little bit more complicated when you're talking about weight, so how many people actually travel with these one in flights in the world, and you can make just a very simple model for it. Very simple model for carbon is if you are inside one of those little one of those little basins and you, you're running the model and you know how many people more or less have to fly between this city and that city, so you get that from the data. You can just randomly pick people from this bag. So it's, very, it's a very simple idea. Of course, flying is not all that we do. We don't just fly around all, all the time. So we actually have to know how people commute from home to work. And, so, and to do this, you need the model of how people commute. How people go from one city to a neighboring city. So, right, so in terms of Parma, it used to be something like how you go from Parma to Valdemos and back. So if you're in the you can't get to work to go back. So, so for this, you need much more detail than that. So you need to go to each, each country, get their census information. The, the census asks everyone where they live, where they work. You can map this into these little basins that I, that I described. And you can connect the basins according to how many people 
the travel between one and the other. So this gives you a grid, or, or rather a little network over there, of how people commute from home to work. Right? So they go in the morning, they come back in the night. So it's a very limited time scale. And there's not as a tier, the time scale is very different from the, the flight network. The flight network, when you fly somewhere, you usually go for a couple of days. Here, you're going for a few hours and then you're coming back. Hmm? Now, of course, the problem here is So the problem here is you only have data for a lot, around 30 countries. There, you're lucky enough that they are distributed around multiple continents, so you have data models for every continent. <coughs> but there's a lot of places where there is no data. Now, of course, what you what you do for this is yes, so what you do for the countries where you have no data is you have to extract a statistical log that is able to, to fill in the gaps. Right? So you can so this is the classical gravity log that's just been studied uh, I believe even Mark mentioned it a couple of weeks ago when he talked uh, and this is basically how in, in transportation you model people traveling from one to from one one city and how cities attract people. So we can see it's called gravity log of course because it's modeled in terms of the the number of people in your city that works more or less as a mass, and then you have a function dependence that goes there. You can, if you, if you look just at the function dependent uh, with the distance, you can see that it's an exponential, so you have to put an exponential there, not a power law like this. Not the, the power that you see in, uh, in classical gravitation. And from this, you can fit the data and get a very good fit, a very good model of the data. So what this means is you have. So here I'm comparing, and in, in these plots, I'm comparing basically the predictions of the data, the, the values of the data with the predictions of the model, in terms of population, in terms of population distributions, the dis variation of the distance, etc. So you can get a very good statistical law of how people work. Right? And using this statistical law, you can go back and fill in the gaps of that network for, for the countries where you have no data. Right? Now, because this actually should be up to here. Uh, now, of course, like I mentioned, you have you actually have different different time scales in this process, right? When you're traveling and you're flying especially for time internationally, you're going for one week, one month, two weeks. While if you're commuting, you're going in the morning and coming back at night. Right? You go to work in the morning, you stay there at your hour and you come back. So you have two very different time scales in the problem. Now if you're gonna have a complete description, you can use something that's called the Born of Dynamic Approximation. And what, what you do is you basically integrate over the the, slow, the smallest time scale. So it, you you use as a unit the the day and you and you calculate an effective interaction that takes into account this this commuting pattern, back and forth, these classes between back and forth. Yeah. And using this, you can have a um, very effective description of how people commute, and you can integrate this into a big mobility model. So at this point. So at this point, what you have is a very good description of how people move around, right? how they, where they live, where they go to work, and how they travel around the world. But since you're trying to do, you're trying to do predictions, and you're trying to understand epidemics, you actually look at to have an epidemic model. Okay. So the, the classical SIR the epidemic model is, of course, the SIR model. So what you do is for each of these places that you can find. So each of these populations, we know how many people are there. And you treat them as being in a very simple regime where they're, where they're warm. So people are interacting normally. So you can, you, people start out as being susceptible, so they are healthy. They come in contact with someone that is sick, someone that is infectious, that has the virus, that has the flu. Okay. And they be, and they, with a certain rate, they become infectious. Of course, after a certain amount of time, they recover, and they become recovered and become immune to, the, to this specific disease. So this is the, the classical uh, representation of it. If you want more physics, like the data be something like this, more in terms of reaction to human equations. And of course, one thing you will not 
one thing you'll notice here is mm -hmm. that okay, so starting with a single, even if you start with just a single infectious individual, that individual would match in a few mo two more, each of those with a couple more, etc. So you have to define this branch. So this is all towards like a branching process. Okay? And of course, the rate of branching is called the R0, which is the basic reproduction number that tells you how fast the disease spreads. So you see, originally. So you're defining, and of course, and this means, of course, that in the beginning it's an exponential growth. So you start with one infectious in a completely susceptible population. That infectious infects a few other people and eventually recovers. You can infect more people, more people etc. You can, of course, write the equations for this, which are not too hard. But when you're trying to put this inside the big mobility model, this set of equations is valid inside each each base and each CP, you know, each major transportation hub. So you need to couple them. First, you need you need to discretize them because you don't want and uh, another stochastic capital because you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it uh, deterministically. And here, since these are continuous, they just they assume continuous values, so 1.5. But there is no such thing as 1.5 people. Yeah? You have one person, you have two people. There is no, so you have to discretize them, which is here. So this is uh, how you discretize it in, in time, but also in terms of the population. So you have to use binom a binomial factor. And you have to add stochastic coupling terms. And what these terms basically do is they, take, they, they add all the mobility Aspect to it. So, this means that the number of susceptibles in CTJ times theta delta T would be the number of people over there, minus the number that became, became infected, plus how many people came from other cities to this city, and how many people, minus how many people in the city to other cities. So, that's what those red terms over there mean. Now, so this is the simplest scenario that we would be interested in. Of course, when you're actually looking at the, the realistic scenario, you have to use a more realistic this disease model with, with a latent stage, so where you are infected, but you're not infectious yet, you can spread it. Then the different levels of severity of the disease, where you're, you're sick and you're infectious, but you don't really realize it, so you, you're, you're symptomatic, you don't notice it. Uh, where you, you're sick, but you still go to work and you still travel around because it's not too bad. And very, when you're very sick and you, don't, you just stay home and you do your job. So you put all these things together into. When you put all these ingredients together, what you end up is, it, is something called VIM, which is a global epidemic mobility model. And it's basically a software package that puts all of these ingredients together and lets you, lets you define what the epidemic is, what all the parameters are, and let's see run it. When what you run, you can see, in, so here I'm starting with an infection over there. The little orange lines that you'll start seeing over there are people infected people traveling around. And as they, as, they, as they go to other cities, they infect people in those cities, and then you see the disease spread. So we have to lower scale the number of cases. This is a little visualization that I made, so you can see. So you can easily see how it's spread around the world, and then how the, num the, infection, the number of infected people, infectious people, varies over time. <coughs> so you can do this, and so you look at me and you say, okay, great, you have this little software, it pretty pictures, and it integrates equations. What, what does that tell us? Well, What it tells you is, it's not just a, a software package that I have on my computer that can make pictures. It's something that you can actually go download. It's free available. You can. So this is what it actually looks like. You can design whatever model you want. You can go there and put arbitrary, define arbitrary models with whatever parameters you want. You can run it and you can see the results and make plots and analysis from there. So this is the, and this is basically represents more or less the state of the art in terms of all the models. Of course, this doesn't tell you much about the validity of the model. So what, what does 
the CV or the CV with a package that you can use to, to make simulations and realistic simulations models, but you have to know the parameters. Okay? So it can give you the prevalence, it can give you the number of secondary cases, the number of people traveling, infected people traveling from one location to another. And it, and it, but you need the parameters to use, so what, what are the disease parameters, and you need and you need to make comparisons with, with real data. So what we did was, and this was more or less the, what we had when the the pandemic started in 2009. So what we did was we used this package basically to fit the parameter to fit the parameters of the disease based on the information that we that we had available at the time. So we use the max. The package includes all the flights, so it has the portion of all the flights? <coughs> yes. Um, I mean, you can't actually now. So the way it works is it's a client server. So you want a little to a client that lets you, see the, lets you define all the parameters. This client sends the, the information to our servers that run the simulations and sends the output back. But, that, but the, the simulation is having the actual flights mm -hmm. the actual to different exactly. countries. Yes. We, we're just not allowed to distribute the data, so we have to keep it in our servers. We can let you use it remotely, but we can't keep it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the range of the, the intent range of the flights. Do you, when you, do you use the, but do you use the, the present day flights for the ones, uh, say, five years ago or, or next year? Which, which flights are you using? Mm -hmm. These, I believe, are from a couple of years ago. But they are more like you, I mean, the way they vary is more or less the way. You know more or less what the way the the way the market evolves, and you can and you can adjust it to make, to make it realistic. Uh, so what we did was use, uh, like I said, a maximum likelihood approach. So in this way, the way it works is you try a bunch of parameters, you compare them with reality, and then you and using that you can see what what is the most likely parameter, most likely value to those parameters. So you can determine this, and you can do this in real time. So, um, based on the on the data, and using the using these parameters, we predicted that that they are not so. The, how virulent the disease is, how fast it spreads, to be around 1.75, and this was actually confirmed from viral biological measurements it's, um, by other groups, so completely independent. Mm -hmm. And here, I should emphasize that here, what you're doing is you are, you are fitting parameters of an unknown disease. When you did this, it was still not hasn't been biologically analyzed what the disease was. It wasn't known. These papers came out a little bit later. Um, and you're doing this in, in real time. So while the disease is, is spreading or was progressing, and based on information, so, so this goes back to that idea of, of the data, of the open data that's available. So data that is open and available, you can go to news, you can go to the, the health authorities in each country and get the cases they are reporting, etc. You can use this to make this to make this fit. Now, when you do that and you actually run the model and you find the best parameters, this is what you get. So this is our comparison between what we projected, which which are represented by the, by the gray bars and what, act, what was actually reported and confirmed afterwards. Right, so here, so you can see that you get a pretty good agreement around the, around the world. There's a, there's a few countries that are particularly bad, but this can be attributed both to our, to problems with our data, to the problems with data and the <coughs> authorities. And just so you don't think this is just a, just a fluke, so this is what actually happened. So that's the data. Th those are our predictions, the gray lines. And this is the usual fluke season. So you can see that this was a disease that was very different from what, what people are, are used to. But even so, the model was able to reproduce it and, and make predictions in advance. And here, actually, I'm not sure if I have the, the reference here. I think it's a, but I'm sure it's at the end. But, and basically, the, the paper where we published these predictions came out beginning of September 2009. And most of these results were published until October or November. So we were making predictions ahead of time of what was going to happen in terms of, of, of the global spread. So this, and these are basically the, the ingredients that the, 
that the model has at this point. We, have, we know where people are, we know how they move, so the population and how they travel, how they commute. We have a reasonably good model of the epidemic spread, so of the, of the epidemic and how the spread of the person. But, there, but the big factor that, that we're missing, and actually was not a big problem in this case, was how people react. So all of this approach rests on the assumption that people continue to travel, and continue to move, and continue to behave normally. So this is all based, on the data and all the analysis is based on normal behavior. And you're, and you're applying it to a situation that is not normal. So you're, you're extrapolating it. In the case of the age one and one pandemic, we were lucky because the, the disease was not, was not too severe. There was a bit of media, media panic in the beginning that people didn't, didn't go completely crazy about it. We didn't change their behavior noticeably, so our approach actually worked very well. But now we need to close this loop. We need to, to be able to model how people react and feed that back into our models so that, we can, so, so that the model can adapt to what's actually happening in real time. Instead of just assuming that that things, <coughs> that things continue as normal, which is obviously not the case if it's, a, if it's not a very serious disease. So if you think in terms of Ebola or smallpox or something where you have people dying, of course the behavior will change very, very, very dramatically, and of course none of this will be done anymore. So this, going back to the SIR model, for a lot, make it easier because we're trying to understand the fundamentals of this, and it's still not very well known. There is no data on the reaction on, on how people react, so we still don't know very well how behavior changes. We're, we're actually in collaboration with a group in, in England that's trying to collect this data and figure out ways of actually trying to assess this. There is still no data available. Is there a question? Um, so we have to model, so we have to go back to the basics and understand what's happening and what, what can we do. So the obvious approach is, okay, so we have the usual three compartments, we have susceptible, some healthy people, we have infectious people, and we have recovered people. When you hear in the news that there is some there's an outbreak or a disease or something, you're gonna we intend to change your behavior. We say we need things like washing your hands more, or being more careful, or coughing on your elbow, etc. And what this will do is this will if it works, is this will reduce the likelihood that you will get infected. Right? So in a sense, since you are since you are afraid, so F is for fear, mm -hmm. so you are susceptible, but you are afraid of getting sick, so you are more careful, and that means that you are less likely to become infected. So we represent this. Uh, so beta is the, is the rate at which you become infected, and you, we reduce this by R beta. So you are slightly less likely, or very much less likely to become infected from that. Yeah? But how, so this, basically means that you have two different types of healthy people. You have healthy people that are behaving normally, you have healthy people that are changing their behavior in a way that reduces their risk of becoming sick. And you can say, okay, that makes sense. Now, how do people become, uh, become aware that they should modify their behavior? This is the important part, right? So you can say, you can say that people become afraid of, of being sick by coming in contact with infected people. So you see someone that is sick, and you say, okay, maybe I should be more careful, so I'm gonna change my behavior, and I'm gonna try to reduce my problems. So, so now, when, you come in when, when a sceptical comes in contact with an infectious individual, you can become infectious, or you can become afraid of becoming infectious. Yeah. And if you're afraid of the disease, and you're afraid of, of being sick, that everybody that you see around you is, is healthy or had the disease and recovered and said it's no problem, then you're, you're more likely to say, oh, this is no problem. So you go back to your old practice. Right? So basically, this is the dynamics of how, of how you might change your behavior. You become more afraid of the disease when you come in contact with uh, sick individuals, and you become less afraid of it if you you're only in contact with it. So, in this scheme, media will not play a role in transmitting the information. News? At this point, no. I mean, you can, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not talking about that here, because I don't have time but there is one, there are ways of modifying this to make it. So you can make, you can make people spontaneously go from here to here. Yeah. 
at a certain rate and that corresponds to the in Well, here I'm talking just about how people interact with each other. So far. And, there, and there's another model that's a little bit, that's a little bit more complex than this. Right. So you can go back, you can write these equations, and you have again the same continuous equations that you can integrate numerically. You can, of course, you can't actually get an analytical solution, so you have to play a little bit with them. So you say, okay, for early time, so in the, in the beginning, uh, the number of susceptibles is very close to one, so everybody is healthy more or less, there's one or two infectious cases. You can simplify the equations and you get you can get an analytical solution for the number of infections, and this is basically the same as SIR normal, right? So if you look So if you look at that, at that model, so if you, look, if you look over there, if there are no, if you only have one or two infect, infected people in, your, in the beginning of the process, there's basically nobody here and everything behaves as normal. So, right? so in the beginning, the number of infected people continues to grow. Now, but what happens with the, the people that are actually sick? Right? So again, you simplify. It's not a good day for listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so you can simplify the equation for the number of, of people that are afraid, and you get and you get that expression. Now the important thing about this expression is that it has an interplay between two factors. Yeah? So it has an interplay between how fast people are getting are getting sick around you, and how fast you are losing. You're coming in contact with healthy people and you're losing the fear of disease in a sense. Right? So you have these two factors coming into play. So and you can so you can put this and solve the integrated equations numerically, and you can see this. And what you get here is based so the black line is, is the median over five thousand simulations, and the, the blue line basically gives you gives you a, a view of not only of the confidence, but also how, how much stochastic variation you're likely to have, but it also shows you, I believe, 100 real epidemic uh, or real integrated epidemic curves. So each line here, which you can see mostly as a blue haze, is actually a real solution to those equations. Okay. And, and here you can see the effect of that interplay between the two things. Okay. As you increase the the infectiousness of, of fear. So, if people become more, are more likely to become scared or to change their behavior when they come in contact with someone that is sick, the more you increase this, since those people, are, in a sense, are protected from the disease, so they're changing their behavior in a way that's reducing the quality of getting sick. You're in effect reducing the epidemic. You're saying people are afraid, so they're behaving differently. So, so they'll get <coughs> not not as many people will get sick. Right? So that's why why you see the curves basically decrease. So, that's the, so this is the number the number of infected people at the time, so the prevalence, and you're of course reducing the increase amount of fear. Now you can also have more complicated solutions that are <coughs> that are that basically correspond to non linear kinds of these equations. So for instance, what happens when you increase the protection from fear? So if the people they change their behavior are much, much less likely to become sick. What does that mean? What does that mean? Right? It means that, okay, you want someone that is susceptible will become, when they come into contact, <laughs> but when they come in contact with someone that is sick, will become, will become afraid, and is much more likely to become afraid than to become sick. Right? And then, when they, while they are afraid of the disease, it's very hard for them to become to become infected. So you're, you're reducing the number of infected, like you would see here. Right? But eventually they recover from the fear and they start seeing only healthy people around them and they say, okay, this is no problem, I can go back to my usual behavior. So at that point what's happening is you're increasing again the number of susceptibles. So you're going back to the beginning. And the result of this, of course, is that you get a second peak. 
right? So you have you, you, the number of infected people increases, people start becoming afraid, they change their behavior. Eventually, they'll see the epidemic coming down, they go back to the normal behavior, but it's too early to actually relax, so you can, and that causes the, the second one. This is actually very, very interesting because originally, and, and from classical epidemic theory, this type of curves that you see here with, with two peaks were expected only due to other situations, so seasonal. So in terms of, of the effect of the seasons, mm -hmm. like you would have a, a very big peak, and then the summer will come, and then it'll go down for a while, and then the winter will come back. And that was the only time when you see a second peak. But here you can see that even just behavior and how people change their, their behavior can, can affect the way they're spreading. And actually, depending on the parameters, you can even have more than two peaks. You can have two, three, four peaks, and this is just a curve. So this is just a phase diagram of what of the behavior you can get as you increase the protection. So here our beta is the reduction that you get, so the protection that you get from being afraid of the disease, from changing your behavior. Here 0, 0.0 means if you are in this state it's impossible for you to get sick. <coughs> so you can have these multiple peaks. So as you increase and here you're increasing <coughs> the virulence of the disease, so how fast the disease is spreading. And here, how, how likely you are to become afraid of the so, so basically, the more, the faster you become afraid and the more protected you are from the disease at that point, the more likely you are to overreact, cause the disease to go down, and then overreact again and come back to normal and cause the disease to go back again. And you have these, these multiple peaks. And potentially you could have more over there, but then that goes into more unrealistic scenarios. So this is the first... The first big result from here is just the way people behave, and this is still in the very simple model, it's just in the SIR model, it's not, in, not even taking into account all the complications of the, of the big scene later, the framework I showed you earlier, you can already have a much more complex behavior. But you can also have more ways of becoming afraid, yeah? this is like similar to what I was discussing. So, so this is the model we were we're showing you, showing you so far, right? You, you come in contact with someone that is infected, you become afraid when you talk with people that are healthy or, or that recover without any problems, you go back to your normal behavior. But you can also have belief based here. What this means is <coughs> is that if you are afraid, you talk with people that are afraid. Or, and you continue to be afraid, or you are healthy, you talk to people that are afraid, and you become afraid. Right? So in a sense, you have a second, you have a second epidemic of fear spreading at the same time. So you have not only the, the disease, but also the fear of the disease that is spreading. And these two things are competing with each other. Right? Because if, you are, if you are here, you are protected a little bit from what's happening, from, from becoming from becoming. Infected. So you go back to your equations, you can again do the same. That last number. You can do the same approximation when t goes to zero. Right? And here you get and you get this curve for for the, how the early time behavior of the number of people that are afraid is, and they, and you can see very clearly that here you have two different behaviors and you have two competing effects. One that is causing the number of people to, to increase in the decrease and in, in parallel and similarly to what you, we did for the SIR model we can we find a reproductive ratio for the for the fear, for the concern about the disease. There it is. Because before you can see <coughs> when you put these two things and depending on how they interplay with each other, you can have these two pixels. Yeah. So you can have, again, the same type of thing where fear is spreading very quickly and it's becoming, and it's becoming, becoming predominant and it spreads faster than the disease. You can actually reduce the, the way it spreads, the way it's spreading a lot and cause a second peak. And here you can see that by changing how fast fear is spreading, you can actually delay the second peak a lot more. So you can extend the epidemic in time. So you can actually make things worse for yourself. 
if you have too much panic going on and if this panic is causing people to change their behavior too much. So there, there's a, set, a series of factors you have to take into account. Again, when you do, you can again look at the, at the phase diagram. The phase diagram you see it's a lot more, more com complex. You can actually have just one peak if, it, if you have too much fear or too little fear. In what sense having a lower peak is not good? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if I compare this to graph, mm -hmm. I would rather prefer the second situation than the first, because in the first one you have a lot of people simultaneously ill at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that will collapse any medical system or hospitals or whatever. Well, in the other ones you might get people spread out, but much, much easier to take care of. So, so how it is better to have two or three or seven peaks or whatever, and to have everybody sick at the same time. Mm -hmm. The first one, yeah, the first one. Yeah, but the first one, you have the hospitals collapse in that day. Yeah, and in the same... Most people well, yeah, but, but the point is that you are able to attend the people, uh, I mean, that, of course, depends on the parameters. I mean, this, I don't know if the integral is bigger or not. Mm -hmm. But assuming, no, assuming that it's the same? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, but you can actually have bigger. Yeah, but still. Mm -hmm. So it depends, of course, on what, on what the disease actually is, but it shows that behavior, the way people behave, can, can have a, a serious impact on what's happening. And it's, and it's important to understand how this is happening. Right? I mean, it, you can also have other problems. For instance, you can start thinking that you are here and the disease is completely going away and you stop interventions to cause the disease to disappear and that causes problems because it then brings it back again. And I don't think I have that picture here, but you can actually have, I think there's actually situations where the second peak is actually larger than the first one. So you see the first one, people saying, oh, it's no problem, it's going away, and then you have very big one. So depending on how you interplay with these parameters, and of course you have a very rich world here, you can get very different behavior. So it's something that still needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. So here and here, what I'm plotting is basically that our infinity is the number of people, so the total number of people that get sick. You wait forever as a function of the parameters. Right? And and what you see is that you get a, a nice smooth transition, mm -hmm. between, a, a nice smooth spectrum of behaviors between the. Okay? between the, the different parameters depending on what's happening. It, and at some point, when R0 and beta is equal to 1, you actually have a sharp <coughs> transition between the two. Where if you are here, you're effectively, fear is effectively killing the disease. So it, it's good, it's stopping the, the epidemic. There, it's reducing the number of people and it's the number of people, so this is the curve of the number of total people that get infected, and it's just breaking it completely and going away. So that's the number of people that, that remain susceptible, so remain healthy, that they were never sick. So this is good. But then you also have the other effect. No? So you have this, so you have this epidemic of fear spreading alongside it with the real epidemic. This is causing the epidemic to go down mm -hmm. and ending the disease. Mm -hmm. But you can also have, so but what happens when you do that? So when you say, okay, everything went away, you get, there are no more infectious people, there's only susceptible, there are people that are afraid, and the people that, that recover, and they're still there. <coughs> so you simplify the, the equation a little bit, and what you get is this. So you, get, you, you can solve this equation numerically, and at some point you'll get, you find a term that looks like this. And depending on that term, you can have two, two very different behaviors. If that term is less than zero, then it's no problem. You kill the, you have just enough fear to kill the disease, and everybody's happy. But if that if that term actually happens to be larger than zero, you kill the disease, but the fear, since the fear is killing on itself, will, will remain. So you will have a steady a steady state. So when time goes to infinity, where you always have people that are afraid of this. So this so this. This basically corresponds to, to a permanent behavioral change. So you, you're creating a group of people, and of course there are people going into this group, that change their behavior. 
completely. And there will always be a fraction of the people that will, that will be. So you can see this also as, as how the way, just in terms of, of belief propagation, you can think that this belief will always be there. And you can, and you can actually have macroscopic change in the society. So, the terminus is I'm running out of time. So, I introduced a general framework, to, general framework for modern epidemics. Now, so, that was the software package. And also, a general framework to consider the spread of awareness. Right? So, the, I introduced two, two scenarios. Uh, in the paper, there's actually a third one that I didn't mention, which goes closer to that, to the media effect, the, where you become afraid just because you hear reports of someone that is sick and not actually being in contact with someone that is sick. Uh, of course, there's a wide spectrum of dynamical behaviors. Uh, the way people react can both kill the epidemic completely or can make it longer and worse. Uh, you can different different regions of parameters can result in multiple epidemic peaks. And of course, subsistential propagation can lead to permanent behavioral changes. So we can change and create this little group of people that actually will always be, or this fraction of people will always be with them. So there is some. Some, some publications in media attention gap, in particular these two. So this is where we describe in detail the, the client side of the model, so what, what you need to do to use to simulate your, your whatever epidemic you want. Uh, here in the jocks are actually the, the technical details of how the model is implemented, etc. And the plus one paper in red is where we describe it, so we did all the calculations for the different scenarios, including the, the media attention scenario. And, uh, yeah, and of course, more results on, on this field. Uh, and just before I end, I'd like to announce that I'm organizing a workshop on computational approach to social modeling. And if you're interested, uh, you can submit your, your papers by January. But it's extreme, there's a list of topics. That, yeah, after we cover some disease, you can be susceptible again. Uh, in this case. You can. I mean, that's and the, the framework. So the model in software can take that into account. Here, we, I didn't mention that because we're talking about influenza, so flu-like flu -like symptoms. And those, you, once you have them, you can't have them. You can only have a different kind. So we always assume that when you go into R, you can't go back into S. But there are several classes of models where it closes you and you go back in. And there you can have even more, more complex behavior. Is there any evidence, well, uh, experimental evidence, of this multiple, multiple peak extractor in cases in which it's not explained by, by systems? Yes. Uh, yeah, so especially in the pandemic, there were several cases where, where people would see these two peaks and weren't sure where they were coming from. So that was one of the reasons why we started working on this and how we can create these multiple peaks so that we can understand where they where possibly they are coming from. Because if you ask the information, in the lab, it's about the flight connection, or I mean, it's about just the flight, or the people that they use the, this flight as a connection. It's about the passenger or the flight. But do you know if people are being taken to trains to get to the final destination, or you just know which are the? So you know, you know which airplane you go from which city to city, and you know on average how how full the planes are. But you don't know if these people come from another flight. You don't know if you can cover another flight. You can actually, and I didn't talk about this here, but analytically you can actually put this into the model and assume, because you can look, another data you can get. So this is what we have is segment data. So how many people go from one city to, from one airport to the other one connection. You can also get market data. What market data is how many people fly from Madrid to San Francisco, regardless of how many flights you need to take. And if you put that data, it makes the calculations a little bit more complex, but it doesn't change the behavior. It doesn't? No. Not significantly, no. Because you always be dominated by the red flags, because that's, that's the way most of the people are. It's a nice feeling.
I guess your model is in a well mixed population. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so maybe the question has no <laughs> no no reason here. <laughs> but normally, when you see things about the epidemic modeling and how to repress the, the epidemic, the, they speak about two ways of reducing it, which is one reducing the probability of getting infected mm -hmm. when you're in touch with someone, which is I I guess what uh, your work is about. And the other one is changing the topology of the interaction. Yes. <coughs> so, um, is there a way of adding this uh, this second uh, way of reducing the epidemic model you in your framework? Or yes and no. So you can actually put, for instance, age structure and say that people of this age are more likely to interact with people of that age when it is not. No? So you create a network. So you create a network of contacts, so you can do this. But we, it's not in the. This is not part of the of the package that you can use freely. So this was we did this. It's in I believe it's in this paper. The MC question we did it. Well, we basically did this. We, we had our model. We modified it to take the instruction into account, and we actually compared that with a very detailed model of individual-based model of, of Italy. So there, there's this, this group in Italy that built this giant model of 56 million people where they, where they track each person individually, separately, so, and how they travel and how they move around. And everybody ha has, a, has a home and has a place of work and they go from home to work specifically from even within the city. So it's, it's a very detailed model. And where you compare that with this model. And you can see that you, you can get our model, since it's well mixed, tends to overestimate the numbers a little bit. But overall, you get the same model. Yeah, on the on the scales, of course, where the two models are compared. I can't give you information at the individual level, but I can give you at the city level when you compare it to the city level. Even when you divide by age groups, for example, you get very very good results. Okay, but, mm, my question was a bit in the in the sense that do you have an idea if it is would be more plausible to 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 act on the behavior to reduce the beta? Mm -hmm. or to act on people to say, stay at home, and uh, it would be more effective? Or you, uh, you, you can do both. I, I said, here we studied this because it was, the, was the, for two reasons. First, it was the simplest thing we could do, add on the meter, mm -hmm. change that uh, Because originally, <coughs> we wanted to put this inside the big model again and see what happens. But it's much more complex, and there's a lot more things you need to understand before you can do that, really, and understand what actually comes out of it. And also because when you look, for instance, in terms of of age structure, this deprivation is which in principle you assume it's something that's relatively well, well understood. There's very, very, very few data about it. There's data for a few countries in Europe. There's, I believe, one or two studies in the US. Mm -hmm. But overall, there is no there is no information. And then if you look at places with very different societal structures, like India, Africa, China, those matrices will be very different. So you can assume that between Portugal, Spain, Italy, England, uh, Holland, etc., they'll be more or less the same because people behave more or less the same. They're European, they have the same culture. No? But when you try to generalize that to other countries, it's very hard. And there is no data. Also, there is no good information on how people, on the age of people actually flying. So it's very hard to find that data. Airline companies have it, but they won't give it to you. I tried it. They, they don't do it. <laughs> uh, and then, so you have a problem where you have very, very limited data, and then you have absolutely no idea how to modify that data to put, to put these behaviors into account. So it's ideally that's the direction we want to go, but that's one order of magnitude more complicated than, than what is possible right now. This uh, this propagation of fear is is very very interesting, but uh, you are using it, you are modeling exactly as a as another uh, disease, mm -hmm. and this is an approach. But I believe that there are changes. There is something, uh, I mean, sort of the attitude of, of cleaning my hands mm -hmm. is not because I am in contact with people with cholera every day. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's, uh, and it's not because I have fear of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I was when I was a child. I was taught to do that, and mm -hmm. I, I continue. Mm -hmm. In this, it seems that the, the change of fear is something that can be not a not a Poisson or mm -hmm. a Korean process of modeling, but something more permanent. 
Yeah, I mean, and, and part of that first is represented by that, this idea that the fear can continue. So change yeah, but the, this is continuing because there is always a it's endemic. So it's a normal mm -hmm. population, and the, the people has fear is changing in time. Mm -hmm. But they think, at least for some habits, the habit, the people don't change habits so much. They mm -hmm. get an habit and they keep it. No, I agree. But first, so, okay, it's a first approach. I, I yeah, it's a first approach. And also, one of those things that you saw during the pandemic was there were campaigns everywhere telling people wash your hands, more, yeah. use more of these little cleaning products. It's, I mean, in Europe and even in the US and in airports, especially in airports, you see like cleaning products everywhere for people to wash their hands. Mm -hmm. So they made it much, much, much more likely that you would do it during that period. And then, and even now, you still see them not as much as you see, but you still see them. So, so there was that temporary change of, or attempt to temporarily change the at least in a small aspect. Of course, a lot of it goes to culture and how you were raised and all that. Any questions? Yeah. If not, uh, let's thank um, Bruno Gay. <laughs> and uh, will be still here uh, one week or something, no? <laughs>